One limitation of valence bond theory is the idea that bonds are localized between a pair of atoms, each having a half-filled orbital, and the overlap of those orbitals creates a bond localized between those two atoms. If that were true, then in this benzene molecule, we would see two different carbon-carbon bond lengths. We would see three long bonds, and we would see three short bonds. Because as we know, a single bond is longer and weaker than a double bond, which is shorter and stronger. What we actually observe with benzene is different. All six of the carbon-carbon bonds have identical lengths. And thus they're equivalent. What's more, a carbon-carbon single bond is longer than the observed bond length which is in turn longer than a carbon-carbon double bond. This leads us to believe that these bonds are in between single and double. Maybe something like this. Our explanation of this phenomenon is resonance. There are two possible resonance structures of benzene. Note the difference in location of the pi bonds. These two structures are connected by these curved arrows. The tail of the curved arrow is where it begins, the head is where it ends up, and when it has a head like this, with a double barb on it, it represents the movement of two electrons. So each of these curved arrows is moving a pi bond from one set of carbons to the adjacent set. So this curved arrow here moves this pi bond from the topmost and top right to the two rightmost carbons. Incidentally, if you have a curved arrow that looks like this with a single barb at the head, that's called a fish hook, and that represents the movement of one electron. We'll get to one electron processes later. For now, focus on the double barbed arrow. Now, this doesn't mean that the electrons are actively moving. What it means is that the structure of the molecule is the average of these two resonance contributors. And the resonance hybrid represents the bonding in actuality, and it is the weighted average of the important resonance contributors. Weighted average just means that in some cases, one resonance contributor will be more important and thus contribute more to the resonance hybrid than others. In this case, both resonance contributors are equally important. Now, this pattern that we see with the three curved arrows inside the benzene ring, that's a resonance pattern called conjugated pi bonds in a ring. We'll talk about other resonance patterns momentarily. Just remember some rules for drawing your curved arrows. For the purposes of resonance, the tail must begin on either a pi bond or a lone pair. The head of a resonance arrow can end on a sigma bond or an atom. If it ends on a sigma bond, it creates a lone pair. Sorry, if it ends on a sigma bond, it creates a pi bond. If it ends on an atom, it creates a lone pair. Let's just point out that here, these curved arrows, the tail is beginning on a pi bond, 
and ending on a sigma bond. So each of these curved arrows takes a pi bond and makes a new pi bond. Now let's look at the different resonance patterns. We already saw conjugated pi bonds in the benzene ring with three curved arrows that all go pi bond to pi bond. Now let's look at another pattern, a pi bond between atoms with different electronegativity, pi bond with delta En for short. One example might be a pi bond between carbon and nitrogen, or a pi bond between carbon and oxygen. In both cases, you have a resonance structure where the pi bond electron pair becomes a lone pair on the more electronegative atom. So the curved arrow would look like this, or like this. The resulting resonance structure for the compound with nitrogen would give a plus one formal charge on the carbon and a minus one formal charge on the nitrogen. For the carbonyl, we'd end up with a plus one formal charge on the carbon and a minus one formal charge on the oxygen. In each case, the tail of the curved arrow begins on a pi bond and ends on the atom, creating a lone pair. And you only need one curved arrow for this resonance pattern. I've just shown two different examples. Another resonance pattern is to have a lone pair adjacent to a carbocation. For instance, here we've got an oxygen adjacent to a carbocation. In this case, you can have one curved arrow that turns that lone pair into a pi bond. Here's our resulting structure, and now what we've done is by moving the electrons from oxygen toward carbon, we've moved the positive charge from the carbon to the oxygen. In general, your curved arrow will always begin on a lone pair and end on a sigma bond creating a pi bond, and it's always a single curved arrow in this pattern. Another pattern is to have an allylic carbocation. So what is an allylic carbon? It is a carbon that is bonded to a double bonded carbon. The double bonded carbons are what we call vinylic carbons. And so the carbon that's bonded to one of them is the allylic position. So here what we can do is have a single curved arrow that moves the pi bond like so. And here is our resulting structure. You can see the carbon on the left was vinylic and the carbon on the right was allylic. And now we switch them because we switched the position of the pi bond. And we've moved the carbocation as well by moving the electrons. In general, with your curved arrow, the tail always starts on a pi bond and ends on a sigma bond. So what you're doing is creating a new pi bond. And you only need one curved arrow for this. Another resonance pattern is to have an allylic lone pair. So notice here I've drawn this with the nitrogen in the allylic position. But I could draw any atom that has the capacity to bond more than once and has a lone pair there. I could have a carbanion, or I could have a neutral oxygen as well. In any case, here we're going to need two curved arrows. We're going to take that allylic lone pair and turn it into a pi bond. That exceeds the octet on the central carbon. So, in order to relieve that, we have to have a second curved arrow that takes that pi bond and turns it into a lone pair. And so here is our resulting structure. And notice 
that we've preserved the total charge. We started out with no non-zero formal charges. We ended up with an ammonium cation and a carb anion. And plus one plus negative one gives you zero. And this pattern will always require two curved arrows. The first one is starting on a lone pair, ending on a sigma bond, and creating a pi bond. That's this curved arrow here. Starts on the, lo the allylic lone pair, ends here on the sigma bond, and it creates this pi bond. The second one is starting on a pi bond and ending on an atom to make a lone pair. That's this arrow right here, starting on this pi bond, ending on this carbon, and creating this lone pair. So right here is a summary of the different patterns. Now, um, just remember uh, a couple of rules when you're doing this. As long as you're following the patterns, you'll be okay. But um, the first rule is don't break sigma bonds. Right, as long as the tail of your curved arrow is either on a lone pair or a pi bond, you'll be in good shape. When we're breaking sigma bonds, then we're actually doing reaction mechanisms, not resonance. Another really important rule is that you can't exceed the octet rule for any second row element, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. In fact, really the only time it's okay to not have an octet is with a carbocation, but that's a sextet. So you definitely want to practice drawing resonance structures. Let's try a practice problem right now. So here's a molecule. With this molecule, first I want you to check for a resonance pattern. Once you've identified and written down the resonance pattern, then you will draw the curved arrow or curved arrows. In step three, you're going to draw the resonance structure. And then in step four, you're going to repeat. And you'll keep doing this until you've got all of the different resonance structures. And the key is, for each step, use the very bare minimum of curved arrows that you can possibly use. So here, We've got a pi bond with a difference in electronegativity. That's one curved arrow. And we also have an allylic lone pair. The allylic lone pair is two curved arrows. So let's start out with the pi bond with difference in electronegativity, the one curved arrow. So we've identified the resonance pattern and we've drawn our curved arrow. Now we need to draw the result. Make sure you get the formal charges correct. So now we've got a carbocation and an oxyanion. So now we've drawn the resonance structure. Now when we repeat this, we will notice that now we have a lone pair adjacent to a carbocation. Which means we can have a curved arrow like this. And so the result of that transformation moves the positive charge onto the nitrogen. Sorry, the carbon is now neutral. And we still have our oxyanion. And there's no other resonance activity in the molecule. Now, if we had started with the allylic lone pair, we would have used 
two curved arrows, and we would have ended up with only one resonance structure. Sorry, only a total of two resonance structures instead of three. So we would have generated the resonance structure with the ammonium and the oxyanion, but we would have lost the one that has the neutral nitrogen and the carbocation and the oxyanion. That's why you always want to use a minimum number of curved arrows for each step.